Yeah, so what? So the the way that plays out is at the point during the AGM, the chairman would come out and say the board does not recommend a re-election of X, Y, Z. Yeah. Um, Importantly, though, the principles we've been talking about are for public companies, so that's publicly, public companies are public companies limited by guarantee. They don't apply to private companies. Thank you. And I think just in um, addressing um, behave, individuals' behaviours, I think we may have um, answered this question, that um, it's just in relation to disclosure, and if an individual does not believe in conflict of interest, um, and or has conflicts in relation to the rest of the board and some recommendations in how best to manage that. And I think Paul sort of referred to that just um, prior to this, but whether or not you'd like to add further comment. I would like to add comment in there because there is law, and it came out of um, one of the recent cases that's just suddenly escaped me, but, uh, oh, James, uh, not James Harley, the HIH litigation. Um, there is um, judicial comment to say that if you as a director are aware that another director has a conflict of interest, or let's call it an interest that hasn't been disclosed, because of course it's for the board to decide whether a conflict exists. If you're aware that another director has an interest and that has not been disclosed, you as part of your director's duties are obliged to disclose that to the board. So in those circumstances, it would be appropriate if you thought, if I thought that Paul had forgotten, let's just say he had forgotten that he had an interest in a particular matter that we were discussing, that I'd either job Paul's memory quietly to one side, or if that um, Paul didn't think there was an interest warrant of, worthy of disclosure, I might have a chat to the chair. Um, that's where this whole issue of conflict of interest, I think people can get themselves into knots and I think a more transparent process where directors look out for fellow directors as well is one much better from a behavioural perspective in terms of board dynamics and let's face it, we're all human and we do have memory lapses like our former Premier of New South Wales had, so um, if he can have them I'm sure we can as well and it's good if you've got a collegiate enough board for someone to say, oh Sarah Jane, didn't you mention six months ago that you had an interest in that block of land that we're now thinking about do building a ditch over? Something like that. Thank you, Sarah Jane. Um, so we might just uh, finish on um, uh, one final question from Jeanette and Bansdale, unless there's um, anybody else at one of the venues that might like to ask a question. And she refers to your reference um, uh, of the importance of contracts for directors and whether um, that is also the same for non-remunerated directors. My view is that it's important that you have some form of documentation in the form, and commonly in a contract, or letters of appointment, so that the director has and uh, knows what is expected of them in terms of if there's no remuneration, there's also whether they're going to get their expenses paid, what committees, how many they're in, um, expected to uh, become members of and what their time commitments are. And importantly, it is that contractual link between the individual and the company to ensure that the company also um, fulfills its obligations in terms of having directors and officers insurance available to the director, um, allowing the director to have access to documentation, although that is enshrined in the Corporations Act. I think it's good practice to have some form of documentation whether you want to call it a contract or a letter of appointment, I think that's a bit moot. The point is to have some evidence of this is the terms of your engagement. And it's not dependent on the fact that whether you are remunerated or not. And just on a minor point here, it's, um, under the Corporations Act, directors are a discrete legal entity. They're not employees. Mm -hmm. So when you think about contract, I mean, most people are moving into a space of something they're very familiar with is you know, employment contracts. But because directors aren't employees, it's not going to be an employee contract in that standard form most people are used to. So the letter of appointment is the sort of standard vehicle, and then the level of detail in that will vary depending on the complexity of the organisation. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you. And um, so fortunately we've um, really done very well with our time today, and uh, we're going to um, just draw to a close. I'd really appreciate it if the venues could maybe unmute their microphones and if we could just um, uh, join and say thank you very much to both Sarah Jane and Paul for their uh, contributions today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you.
Thank you. And, and just, in, just in closing, I'd just like just in closing, I'd like to just confirm that we will be um, just in closing, I'd like to just confirm that we will we'll be sending out copies of the presentation today, as well as um, a, a survey to um, receive feedback from you all. So thank you very much. Um, in advance for responding to that survey and if you have any questions or queries please feel free to contact us on the mobile number that was provided um, and thank you very much for um, joining us today and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. I'll uh, see how we can uh, meet the, the line.